Welcome back, Van Flippers, Liam Goaters, whatever you want to call yourselves. It's not every day that we get to have one of the, I don't know if you want to call them pillars, but definitely someone who's influenced the metalcore scene as much as this band has. We don't normally get to have that kind of caliber of band on the podcast. So we are blessed today and graced with the uh, members of Zeo. Jeff and Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you for taking uh, you know time out of today and joining us. Our pleasure. Nope. Yeah, no problem at all. Where are you guys uh, coming from today? I know you're separate. For those who aren't watching, mm-hmm. you guys are all not in the same area. The band is from originally from West Virginia, relocated to Philadelphia. But where are you guys calling? Uh, where, you know, where are you at today? I I'm actually like 30 minutes outside of Pittsburgh. And and yeah. Yeah, I'm in I'm in Brooklyn. Okay. Uh pretty much everybody uh, everybody's pretty much around Pittsburgh right now. So, yeah, except me. Cool. So. And um you guys have a new album coming out in like a couple weeks here. Uh this will probably be played yeah. closer to that time, but the uh it's a follow-up to your last 2016 full-length uh, well-intentioned virus. Um so what can we expect from the Crispin Corridor? Because like I know you guys sent me the album literally like two days ago and I haven't had time to check it out <laughs> other than the single. So but like what can we expect, you know, on the record that would be different from the 2016 release or anything like that? Hmm. Oh man. Uh because on some of your EPs I would say... you kind of explored some kind of like programming and other you know, other kind of dynamics tossed in. So I was wondering if that's gonna carry over or in, into the new record. Oh yeah, I mean, there's. Uh, I, I would say the the biggest difference between this and well-intentioned virus is, I, <clears throat> I think well-intentioned virus was very. We purposely made it very direct. It was a very direct, quick, you know, just kind of rock and record, you know, succinct little forty-minute standard. Uh, the, I think the biggest difference with this one is we just take our time with stuff. Um, it's a lot moodier, uh, a lot. A lot of slower stuff, like not necessarily like ballads, but I mean there is elements of that. But it's a uh, no, like I said, we're not in a hurry on these songs, so they they tend to to stretch out, and it's like more of a journey. Uh, but there, there's a lot of uh, sort of like ambience and soundscapes and sound manipulation kind of buried in the mix. It's it's a lot more layered. It's okay. a little bit more like a like a mini movie. And is that yeah, because I these... think. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Scott. Oh no, I, I'm sorry. I this is always going to happen. I feel bad. I'm always no, no, going to step yeah, on it's somebody. We're three. But, um, we're three weigh-in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I think Jeff kind of hit that. It's very cinematic. Um, it definitely still has like burners on it, but but overall, there's like a, a a really cool like like mood set with everything, and it does feel very, you know, movie esque, like the way it begins and ends, and there's like all kinds of different things in the middle. Um, I think there's a lot of places we kind of went that we always wanted to go. Um, I don't think anything's going to feel like out of place, but I definitely feel like people will be like, oh, that's different. But in reality, I, I feel like we've kind of been moving in this direction for a little while. So um, no, I'm, I'm, yeah, we're really excited to see how it goes. Yeah, it's awesome. I, I would assume. I would, I would say that I, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead, Jeff. By all means. No. <laughs> well, no, I was just I just wanted to spin off something Scott said that uh, like it's everything on the record has pretty much existed at some point in the language of Zayo. Yeah, we just kind of really sat on things that in the past might have been like, oh, they did this thing for thirty seconds, and then we never heard that again. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a lot of we, we really dove back into aspects of the band that had gotten uh, not explored yet. Cool. I, it's always curious. I mean, obviously, you're going to still have some traditional Zayo sounding riffage. I mean, you guys are kind of like a riff heavy band uh, for your, I don't know, you guys have been, the band in general has been around for mm-hmm. God, 30 years almost now. So you know, <laughs> traditionally, the band is like a riff and band. So when you say it's like a little longer drawn out, you're not saying that the riffs are gone or anything like that. It's just no. like, like a longer song in general. No, no, no. Yeah. I actually think that there are aspects of this record that is like some of the heaviest stuff we've ever done. 
Um, so yeah, it, it's really hard to explain it in a way that like, there's not really a good like language to say. Cause like you, they are like songs are kind of like, they take more time to like get to where they want to go, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're slow, but they are, there's like a little bit more of like a mid pace level to some of the stuff. Um, there are things that we've done that, that are very melodic on here, but at the same time, like some of the melodic songs are broken up with like some of the most violent sounding riffs that we have, have, have ever done. I mean, I really do think that what this record to me did was like, I feel like there's a maturity level in the writing that like really allowed some of the songs to breathe, but there are songs on here that are just as heavy and, and violent as anything we've ever written. And it's not like unheard of for you guys to have tracks that are a little off, yeah. off pace of Zayo. So it's, it's, it's cool. Like I definitely was revisiting the catalog this week and I noticed that on the EP, what is uh, Xenophobe is the song that I'm thinking of. Xenophile is the song that I'm thinking of, but on, on Xenophobe. Yeah. Um, that song was one of like the first kind of songs that I can kind of remember uh, where there's a, like a, a groove, like a really cool drum groove going on with mm-hmm. like some, uh, you know, um, beat production or uh, drum machines. Is that something that you guys, and again, on this record that you have soundscapes and other things, you know, involved in the ambiance and stuff, do you guys program that stuff yourself or do you have people coming in? I mean, uh, you know, because Jeff, you do the drums, so I don't know if you program those drums and then, you know, write those grooves around it. I do. I think well, on the, my... well, on the, well, okay. the, it depends on which version sorry. of Xenophobe you're talking about. Yeah. Cause there, there is the remix of Xenophobe that's all programmed. Uh, right. The, that the original, the is. original song, that's all played. Okay. That that's would all be played. And, and there, there, there is, there is stuff that we've done uh, occasionally. I know there was the one song, uh, was that on, uh, I always get stuck cause I think of our working titles. Uh, I saw the end. There's like a section where it sounds like a drum machine or something that kicks in for just mm-hmm. like six beats. But that was just more sound manipulation that we did to the actual drum parts. Um, that makes so on this thing, like when now. I say there's like a lot of like, yeah, that might have been it. Yeah, because I was w- I'm listening to it on yeah, Spotify. Yeah, other than the remixes, there hasn't been. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Because I was w- that's why I asked that question about. You know, ex, you know, extra kind of uh, production going invo- involved in the new record because when I'm listening to it on Spotify, it says that that album came out in 2019, but mm-hmm. you know the actual e- uh, the EP came out in 2016. So I was like, oh, maybe that's just when Spotify put oh, it on the yeah. record. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think what we yeah we, we there was a remix. Mm. Yeah. So when you when you listen, yeah, that remix album is specifically centered around like electronic music right no, um <laughs> now there's there's nothing like everything on the new record straight up real drums and i was playing it but there are things that are going on in the background that have maybe their basis starts in electronic music but it really doesn't have that so much as like more of like a like a landscape or a soundscape or ambience or there's nothing really in there that's like I mean, dude, there's some stuff on that remix that are, it's like dancey. Yeah. Um, so there's nothing, yeah, we didn't like kind of get too much into that world. But what we did do is like have like, you know, your normal real live instrument song. And then Jeff or, you know, we had a couple people help us, but like a lot of the stuff Jeff did was like background, just noises or like, or sounds that would kind of add to the feel of of what was happening. So that's more of what, I think we're talking about with this new one. Interesting. Okay. Do you, when you guys say that you guys, um, you know, slow it down and everything like that, or take a, you know, let it breathe. Would you be, would you consider it more of like a, a doom kind of sound like that kind of vibe, or is it just like a slower down metalcore version of, of... I think there's definitely there, there's doom. Some... Yeah. Yeah. There is some <laughs> stuff that, that gets, a, that gets a little doomy. Uh, yeah. But it's like again, it's like oh that that the single that we already released, uh, Croatone, um, to me to us was one of the ones that was like oh this is like a little more doomy. I remember we put up a, a snippet of it and somebody said oh it sounds like you, it sounds like you guys have been listening to a lot of the band Earth, mm-hmm. and it was just like yeah I can hear that like so yep. it was 
and that's a good example of one of those songs where the, the bulk of the song is just like kind of really like just kind of spaced out, you know, glacial kind of heaviness. And then eventually the Zayo that people know come out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, we just tend to sit on some of those parts longer. There, there's a 10 minute song on this one. Oh, okay. and it's, <laughs> yeah. And it's probably not as most of it probably doesn't sound like what you would think Zayo would be. I definitely, but again, has elements of everything we've always done. So it was a little dark. The single was a little darker than you know. I kind of remember you guys being in the past and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. not in a negative way. Obviously, the sound, like the doom sound, is is getting into a lot of other genres and it's becoming kind of popular in general. So uh, it's cool. I mean, and again, you guys have been a band for thirty years. You can't just keep rehashing the same thing over and over again. So like. When you guys write new albums, like how hard is it for you guys to come up with ideas for the project, Zayo? Or, or do you guys have like a specific mindset when you're writing music for the band? And, you know, I don't know if we, I think, and this sounds sort of cliched, but like we never go into anything with like, here's what we have to do. Um, usually what happens is, you know, we'll just get ideas and they'll just, usually come from as much of a like natural place as possible. And then we just build on those ideas. Like I've never, and that's the nice thing about the band is I think we've done so much different stuff. I mean, we literally have things that sound like converge. And then we have a song that sounds like the Rolling Stones. Like there's, you can like kind of do whatever. And I think what we never try to box ourselves in, but it's just kind of like whatever the mood is, you know? So like with Croatoan, that song, um, it just, that be, that main riff was the first thing I wrote for that song. And it just kind of structured the rest of the song. Like it, you kind of have that feel of what, what's going to feel right. And then, you know, it'll be, Built it'll around. be kind of picked apart. Jeff will come in and we'll have all these different ideas to like kind of move the song in the way it needs to go. But, but we try really, really hard. Like, I mean, all of us listen to so much different stuff. Um, and obviously all of us like doom metal and all that kind of thing. I mean, the older you get, the less you're into like maybe the most, like the more chaos, but, um, but I think we try really hard to not let that stuff infiltrate to the point where it's like overtly obvious that we're like trying to do something. Um, but those, we use that as influences on everything we do. So we try really hard to be influenced, but not overtly like, oh, like the hard the, the show on the sleeve. Like, here's what it is, you know. Um, but, but I think we just try. We we I try really hard to just let the song speak for itself and not really like force it anywhere um, and and force any type of thing. Just let it naturally happen and let it go where it wants to go. Which sounds like bullshit, but <laughs> that's what we well, try. We, we've do. also <laughs> we've also gotten really good lately about uh, just sort of selective editing. You know, like a, a couple of the songs in this record have been floating around for years, and it's not that we didn't like them. It's just we were we were waiting till they had a home. So we're we're a lot more patient with material now where we're like, okay, this song doesn't have a place. We'll set it aside until it has a place. Mm -hmm. And that's how you end up with an hour-long record uh, <laughs> well, eventually, I think, when you have a bunch of pieces that fit together. It doesn't bother you. <laughs> yeah. I do think, too, that I mean, I, 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 we might be one of the last genres of music, like our whole scene, that still look at albums as albums, too. So, like, a lot of people like a, in the music industry, I would uh, assume that a lot of people are looking for like either singles or like because of the, how Spotify works and, right, Apple right, right. and all that different stuff. Like, but like we, we really do want to like have full experiences with like an album still. Like that's kind of our like main focus has always been how will this record work on with somebody that's sitting in their front of their record player and listening to it on vinyl. You know, we all like vinyl is kind of like our whole arbiter of how we write, like how we set up our records. So like, we're still thinking of, 
of it as albums where maybe a lot of people don't do that anymore. But I, I do think that like our style of music, a lot of the bands do that. You know, a lot of the bands still like the whole experience of sitting through an, a whole album is very important. So, so like Jeff said, sometimes songs will be done and it doesn't fit in that, how we want that album to feel. Mm. So it'll be held back, not thrown out, just held back. Is that, and again, you guys had like a kind of, you guys didn't really release a lot of uh, full lengths between like 2009 and the, and, uh, you know, you had, a, you had a lot of extended plays. Was that because you guys had material left over like that? Like some, uh, some songs didn't fit the albums that you previously released before that time period and you just had kind of like this material that you kind of just wanted to get out? I don't sort of. I mean, well, I don't remember. <laughs> it was how... weird. It, it... Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah. Sorry. What happened was we had such a we had a long the a lot of the big break that we had after two thousand nine. We were still writing and exchanging ideas, and we were trying to figure out: Are we going to be our own label? You know, are we going to record stuff and then shop it to something? Like, how are we going to do this? And it got to the point where when we did this stuff that ended up becoming well-intentioned virus, the xenophobe seven inch, the Pyrrhic victory EP, all the, all that different stuff. What we did was we, we started the tracking for everything at one time. And that's what we do now. Like a lot of times we'll, we'll record a giant batch of material, like enough for almost two records. And then once we get it started, then we whittle away and we're like, this is the album. This is going to be a five song EP because these five songs work together. These two are going to be on a seven inch there's this random one here. Oh, let's find someone to do a split with. <clears throat> so all the materials in play. And after we start it, we figure out what makes sense. How do these things group? How do they, how does each, each little release tell a story? Uh, so it's not necessarily like B side, like uh, for us, an EP isn't stuff that wasn't good enough for the record. The EP is like, okay, well, this is an EP. These five songs have a statement. So that's what these are. Um, but yeah, that's all plotted out as we're finishing stuff. And we, once we get to that point, like we're like, this is everything we have to work with. Now, how do we organize it? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm Sometimes just... our favorite songs end up on the little, on the little limited seven inches. Yeah. <laughs> like they might be our favorite song, but they, but it doesn't fit on the record. Right. And no, we, I wasn't we saying... know that the album will get more attention. I didn't want it to come yeah, across yeah. like uh, those weren't good enough no, no, no. for the record, but like you said, they, <laughs> they didn't fit in the record. So, but that is that is a big misconception, though, and you're not wrong. Like that is a big misconception in a lot of that we found a lot of music industry people. They're like, "Well, it's an EP. It's it's the stuff that wasn't as good," and we're just like, "Well, we don't think of it that way, like mm -hmm. necessarily. It's just that's it happens to be an EP." Um. So I've got two more questions about the uh, album coming out. One of them is from, well, I, I'll yeah. ask you, I'll ask you uh, the easy one first. What is your favorite song to play personally for you on the new record? Because you both play different instruments. So what is your favorite song to play off the album? Wow. Honestly, I think the two that are going to be released are the ones that are my favorite to play so far. Um, but we haven't really got in a room as a full band mm, yeah. to like play them yet. So like, but, but I think the two, the Croatoan is, I, I, I'm really excited to play that one with everybody. And then the song that's going to be coming out here this week, um, which I don't want to say it wrong because now I've, forget but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah like those yeah, two songs uh, ship, ship of theseus theseus yes. ah good yeah. you know what perfect transition after this so continue with what you're saying because that was about the <laughs> the next question is about that song so yeah but yeah those two songs right now because we did have some like uh odd type of rehearsals like since jeff's in brooklyn and all the rest of us are here we've been able to kind of like get together with the four of us and play Luckily, we I have Jeff's like drum, like performance, so we can play to that. And those two songs have been super fun to get together. Um, 
But like I said, we haven't played it as a full band, which probably is going to be even cooler. Yeah. Jeff, yours? I'm I'm excited for Croatoan too, because it it's one of those songs, and it's it's one of the main reasons that I always fight to keep uh Lies of Serpents in the set. There's just certain types of songs, like the way the notes hit, and like sometimes it's just really simple open notes that just have so much weight when you play them on stage. Like where you can like kind of feel the air move the way that all the the <clears throat> just the frequencies and stuff. Lies of Serpents has that. We hit those first two notes of Lies of Serpents. I don't care how bad the sound in the club is or in the monitors or whatever. That song always sounds good. And it just, it's, it's bad PA system proof. Uh, and to me, Croatoan is kind of set up that way because it's just this big open, you know, it's just, it just sounds massive without there being a lot of notes. And mm. so, Croatoan to me is one that I'm really looking forward to. I don't look forward to Ship of Theseus because th that song, it, it's, it's a motherfucker for my team. <laughs> we'll it's, probably, it's probably the fastest, it's probably the fastest Zayo like double bass drum part yet. And, and it never, it doesn't really let up. Interesting. It's almost like it, it almost verges into death metal uh, bass drum territory. <laughs> so I'm just not looking forward to it from an endurance and my aching aching joint. <laughs> <laughs> it sucks my when you, it joint. sucks it sucks when you do those parts you know those cool parts that are super hard and you record them, but then you got to kind of well it hasn't been that bad because of obviously the pandemic but you haven't had to play yeah. anything, but you know playing tough. Well, stuff. I mean and it's what. When Scott does uh, when Scott does demos for stuff, like he'll send me ideas with like very basic, you know, like I wrote this song and he'll, he'll send like very basic uh, drum parts for riffs. And a lot sometimes he'll be like, I, "We need to keep this," and other times he's like, "Let it go." But I remember when he sent me that one, and I'm just like, "Oh, Scott, I hate you! I hate you! I have to play this now." <laughs> yeah, there was no way around it. It was the only no. part, it was the only part I could do, and I'm like, "I got to do this now." That's hilarious. Um... So the other part, the other question comes from uh, our one of our reviewers on the website, the one actually reviewing your guys' album. So uh, he was ah. he was asking about the ship of I don't want to say what is it the, the Theseus. Theseus Theseus, and he yep. was he was asking if that's a reference to yourselves. The thought experiment applies to the fact that they have no original members in the band. So I don't know if yes that is about it was ab Theseus is absolutely one hundred percent self referential. Yeah. Yes. From Dan, that that's yep. yep. yeah. I guess that would so, be someone to ask the person who wrote the lyrics, but it, it, but no, I mean, we I, we talked about it with him, and he, you know, it, it is kind of a cool thought experiment. And where you end up isn't always necessarily where you think. So the thought experiment is that with the ship, if you change all the boards of the ship, is the ship still the same ship because it's all new boards? But when you change a board on a ship like not all at one time when you're like fixing pieces or changing out pieces over time, the ship does have all new boards, but it's still maintained the same ship. So like with what we look at it as is, you know, the band has went through so not as many as a lot of other bands. So let's be honest, but um, you know, our band has, somehow look, is looked at that it has gone through so many member changes. But those member changes were so gradual. And I think that the way I look at it is the band is still pretty similar to what we were when I joined in 1999. So, like, I do think that the band really did change from that original incarnation to when Brett, Russ, and, and Dan came in. But I don't think that the band is so far away from what it was when I joined it because it's still me, Russ, and Dan involved. And then we have, you know, Jeff and Marty with us now. Um, so the way I look at it is I don't think the ship does turn into a new ship. I think the band just fortifies itself, makes it anew, and maybe even now it's better, mm -hmm. you know, in, in certain ways. Um, but I don't think that it like gets rid of or 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 
you know, any, I, I don't think it like totally absolves the old band. I think that the, that old band is still with us sort of. Um, but yeah, I don't look at it like as like a whole, are we even the same band, but it's a cool thought experiment yeah. to, to do that. Well, and then the, the part of the thought experiment that I like that people leave out sometimes is what if you take all those old discarded boards and build a new ship out of them, which one is the real ship? Oh, curve. Yeah. So it goes into a different level. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Interesting. Which the, the, my original plan, which I got a big kick out of is uh, there was a, there, we put out a, uh, like an archival release last fall of like demos and unreleased stuff from the original band. Mm, like, cool. like even back to original singer, Eric reader. And when that was initially being proposed, it was going to come out after this record. This record was scheduled, was scheduled to come out first. Um, so when I'm, I was just like, Oh, this is perfect timing because in my mind, we were going to put out the ship of Theseus song mentioning this concept. And then we were going to put out a record by the original band after that, which was going to just tie the whole thing together. It just ended up coming out backwards. Um, yeah. But yes, he, yeah, you're, you're, we're, yeah, his we, question. We're definitely aware. Right. We're definitely yeah. aware. Cool. Well, yep, yeah. That was the whole point. Yep. He will, he will love that answer. I'm sure. So that's cool. But speaking of, you know, getting into that topic, I was, I was going to bring it up at some point. Uh, Cause you guys, I mean, this has been the longest running lineup of the, the band in general. It's been uh, like you said, you joined in 99 Scott, mm -hmm. uh, Jeff, like 2000, I mean, 20 years. So, right. 2005. Well, 2005. Yeah, 2000, yeah. Well, 2005. yeah. Okay. So my question about right after funeral of God came out. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And even more so for you, uh, Jeff, but my question is like, cause they always all, you know, it was around for you know years before you even joined Scott. So like, how was it? Cause normally, you know, I get to talk to people that have had members come into their band. We don't necessarily interview the new members and obviously not your new members or anything like that, but what was it like coming into an, um, an established band? And I guess we'll start with you, Scott, because you came in earlier and you were mm -hmm. on, you know, some pivotal releases following your, in, your coming into the band. So what's it like coming into a band that's kind of established already? And like, as a new person, like, are you worried about like how much writing you'll get to do? Or are you just stoked to be a part of this, you know, band and everything? I'll tell you, honestly, it's I remember when I joined, Zaya was like right on the, like it was on the edge of like sort of breaking. Cause like blood and fire definitely opened up the band and everything. And there was a huge momentum from that record. And then all the things that happened with Brett leaving and all that. Um, when I joined, I never, I was, I, I was really, really excited about the opportunity to, to step into a band that was on its way somewhere. But we still like when I joined, I mean, Zaya was still playing to like 20 people. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't an automatic like I joined and it was like, holy shit, we're playing in front of 500 people. Um, you know, we still it was it was really still building and building and building. So I I think I felt like I came in right at a great time because it wasn't I was I still had to work with everybody. Um, and another thing that was great about joining it was my relationship with Russ, I mean, I've known Russ since ninth grade in high school. So we always kind of, I'm trying to think of the word, we, like we always sort of like mashed together really well as friends. We were really close friends. We liked each other's playing styles. We both were in bands that both each of us kind of liked. And, you know, we, we had a really good friendship and a really good like relationship even musically because we liked a lot of the same stuff so when i joined i didn't feel that i was the new guy that wasn't allowed to have any input mm -hmm. uh these guys when i joined they were really really open um you know nobody nobody was ever there wasn't any like horrible uh like personality that like wanted to take charge like jesse and russ and everybody was like really really like 
open and, and, and excited about anything that I would add. Um, you know, but I felt, I was like, look, I'm, I'm not going to come in here and try to like take over or anything. I just, but I, I came in and we all worked together really, really well. And that's like one thing with Zayo that did get overshadowed a little bit because of so much of the drama that gets talked about from the band. But like when we were writing, really rarely was it bad. I mean, it was always pretty, really comfortable. Like everybody was excited. And there were times when people would do things that maybe each of us didn't like, but overall, like we were really behind each other and, and positive reinforcement on riffs and parts and really worked hard together as, as a, as a unit. So I never felt that way. And, and I think that when I joined with Liberate, like it really did, we, it still took a good like year or two for the band to like get to the point where we were like, we're like, a, this is a band that we do, you know? Cause like we, when I joined, I was still working two jobs. Then we'd play on the weekends, <laughs> like yeah. stuff like that. Wait, so it was still, wait, a, it was on. a grind. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a grind for, for the good, for a good year, year and a half. Cause even with blood and fire, I mean, I, I would talk to Brett about this and Russ would tell me about shows that they would do. I mean, there's this like, look back and nostalgia of blood and fire, but those guys were fucking busting their, dude, they were playing in like barns and with 10 people, you know, like, and then they would do like big festivals where there'd be a couple hundred thousand people. And then a lot of the pictures you see, or a lot of the videos you see are those big festivals, but man, they were playing like some bullshit Indiana place with 20 people there. And nobody even knew what the shit was going on. Um, so that there was a lot of build up. Um, even after all that stuff that we really had to work really hard to get to where the band did eventually get to. Yeah. You were, you were definitely a part of the grinding years. Uh, you know, the late yeah, 80s. I'm gonna, there we go. That's better. There you go. Let's well, get a little dark. <laughs> yeah. Usually Alex is guilty of that. He'll be down in his basement and we'll start a podcast. The next thing you know, he's like, all you see is the glare off his glasses in the computer yeah, screen yeah. or something. It's like <laughs> Mr. Hand of Inspector Gadget or something. But um, yeah, you got you were a part of obviously the, the grind years for sure. And uh, more so, not more so, but and because like the scene was also just becoming like yeah. within that time period, just like a, a, yep. a real thing. So yeah, like when you, when you joined Jeff, like did you feel any kind of, uh, you know, like I have to earn my place to, so, to, to supply music just because like Zayo already had like a, a sound technically at that point too. So. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems actually kind of the opposite. I felt the opposite. Like, again, I've known these guys since we were in like high school. Yep. <laughs> like, uh, like I, the first time I ever played or traveled with the band, I, I joined two weeks before we flew to Europe. Uh, I actually never even played in a room with Dan until we kicked off Rising End at the first show in Germany. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I ever played Zayo music with Dan was on stage at a show in Germany. Like, it was, like, that quick. Like, I rehearsed with the other guys. Dan couldn't be at the two rehearsals, and then we flew to Europe, and I was in the band. Um, but I knew all the, I knew them all. Like, yep. we all knew each other. We're all from the same hometown. Yep. It was, like, it was so... I, I never felt, like, the new guy thing. Because, like, no. even on the, you know, on the plane or, you know, in the tour bus in Europe... We're all just like we're talking about like you know gossip about people in the hometown and like oh did you hear what so and so from high school's up to like it was like I never had that new guy thing. Musically, I remember it was like the, the opposite. It was like oh uh, I mean we I played with Russ and Marty the first time. I don't think Scott you were there. And I, I remember yeah, I, I can't played remember. with Russ and Marty. We we did a, a couple songs just to see if it was gonna work. And Marty called me. He's like, I, I, I thought it was great. I called Dan and Dan's like, I'm glad Jeff's in it. Now, maybe now we can play at zero. Like it, it turned into like, Oh, Jeff's able to do the like really fast grindy stuff. Let's like bring that in. And it was, so I immediately were like, Oh, you can do these things. Let's, let's do that. Let's, uh, no, I mean, I immediately, like when we were writing the, we were writing the fear within the first year of when I joined and Scott and I were just trading tapes back and yeah. forth and giving, you know, I was giving him input and 
it was the same way it is now. Like I, yeah. cool. It was yeah. like seamless. It was you, seamless. Well, that's. I was I mean, also lucky with that. I didn't. Ha- I didn't have to be the guy to replace Jesse. I also didn't yeah. have that pressure. Stephen is, already. Stephen Stephen Peck buffered that. Right. Yeah. For those, like, like a year and a half, two years. Well, I think too. Like a lot of the reason yeah. why Jeff was. I mean, Jeff is a guy that's been on our radar since. I mean, we, like we were all fans of his band in high school, so like we all knew what Jeff could do. And when Dan mentioned, well, we should talk to Jeff about uh, joining, we were already like, well, we know what Jeff could do. <laughs> so like we knew that his abilities, his writing abilities, like all that stuff would mesh with us really well. So when he came in, there wasn't like a weird, like uh, big, uh, there wasn't a phase of the band where we were like, well, is Jeff going to be, no, we already knew. And we like, we had Jeff join specifically because we knew. So. Right. Well, that's awesome. Cause you know, most times you kind of get the vibe when like a band that has been somewhat established in general gets new members you know, I always wonder, like, how much does that person worry about changing the band, you know, mm-hmm. changing the sound of the band or whatever. So, you know, not all, again, I don't get to talk to people that have come into the band at some point, but obviously you guys have been there for like 20 years almost. So, or, you know, <laughs> Scott's 20 years, but Jeff almost. Well, and so. I, I think there's a lot to be said, too. There's a lot to be said, too. And I've worked with other bands that that I've dealt with where – you know, where there are member changes. And it also depends on how you do it. Like, is you're going to be successful if you don't try to force the new member to re- mimic the old member and to, 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 like, tread that line. Like, you pick somebody that will fit with what you already do, but you also, it's going to be successful if you let them bring to the table their personality. Yeah, you know, like that's what's gonna make it succeed. That's what's gonna, um, and I, I, you know, it's like look at Iron Maiden, like when they, when they brought Bruce Dickinson in, they weren't asking him to be Paul Diano. They said be Bruce Dickinson, and that's why yeah. it worked. Yep. Because he, you know, he's doing his thing. Yeah, that's true. Um, so let's kind of change gears a little bit. Uh, I was gonna ask you know about Furnace Fest, but kind of dawned on me that. Scott, you may be the only person in the room that have even been to a Furnace Fest. So uh, are you excited to be a part of that again? And like, what was it like playing those first few Furnace Fest, you know, 20 something years ago? And, you know, who are you looking for? I mean, you can both answer this question. Who are you looking forward to seeing at this current or the one coming up? Oh, wow. Um, Yeah, the first one was really, man, but some of us only live through YouTube clips. I mean, I've watched yeah. the DVD back in the day. And because uh, I, I I was just out of high school when that really started happening. I was probably a senior just out of high school when Furnace okay. Fest started happening. But it was the closest one uh, in mm-hmm. general. And I uh, years later, I did make it to like Hellfest. I went to the last Hellfest okay. that happened. So Yeah, those were super fun too. Yeah. Honestly, I think that those festivals just they they have an automatic like wow factor to them because of what it is. I mean, you have all the different bands and, and the shows are, I mean, it, even for the bands, it's like overwhelming because you have so many people that are there. Um, so it's, it's really like, that's, a, I mean, overwhelming is kind of what it felt like for me. That first one was just so unbelievable. I mean, I, my, my distinct memory of it, and I remember talking to Dan about this at the show, we played, we headlined the one night and we headlined over sick of it all. And I remember telling, I was like looking at Dan going, how the fuck are we headlining over sick of it all? Like, this doesn't make any sense. Right. <laughs> and that was back when like, it was weird. And like, it was just me and Russ, and we'd have a bass player and it was whatever. And, um, but I mean, it was just, there, there was such magic in, in those type of things. Cause you, you just, you when you're in the moment i'm sure like you every all of us understand this but like when you're in a in a moment like that you don't really understand how to appreciate the moment and then like once the moment's passed and you look back at it you know you what's special about it you know it like it, it it's just it's unbelievable to to have been a part of that thing and like get to witness it and all the friends we made from it and all the different bands we got to see that like don't even exist anymore. I mean, there's so many things that's just so amazing about it. And yeah, honestly, like 
it's sort of unfair because as long as as long as Furnace Fest does go go according like to plan and it doesn't have to be canceled or moved or whatever, um, the fact that this is going to be like the first thing we've done for the year and a half or whatever of this pandemic is going to like almost be too much to handle. Like, I don't even know how I'm going to be able to be on stage. Like I might cry because it's just insane to think about that. Yeah. But, but, um, but I'm, I'm, I, I like excited isn't even the word for it. Like I'm so overly excited about playing it and I cannot wait. I mean, I'm so excited. I, like the day that we play with Converge is playing every time I die is playing Caven's playing. Caven has been one of my favorite bands forever. So like seeing Caven, um, like so many friends too. Like there's so many friends bands that are playing that we're, I can't wait to see like all those people. Oh um, yeah. Cause you haven't it, seen yeah. anyone really, you know, most people no, haven't like seen you're, anyone. Yeah. Dude, you're gonna, like, this will be the first, I think for a lot of people, this is going to be the first time. I mean, I know that there's some States that are opening up a little bit and like some of the clubs are possibly opening up to like certain like smaller capacities, but, but this is probably going to be the first like real thing like this, that a lot of the bands that are playing, have got to do. Um, and I think it's going to be like, what's going to suck about it. It's going to probably feel like five seconds of your life because it's going to just be so exciting. But, but I, I can't wait. I'm going to try to soak every freaking second of it in because like I said, all the bands that are playing the same day we are. Yeah. I, yeah, I can't wait. Yeah. Well, unfortunately <laughs> for me, it'll be 10 seconds because I have to do it twice in the same day. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I'm looking, I'm that I'm really excited for it as well. I was looking forward to it last year and uh, I was really bummed when they got, you know, postponed indefinitely. Mm-hmm. You know, who knew uh, up until recently until they kind of announced everything that it was still on. But I'm very, very uh, appreciative that most of the bands are still on there. Uh, yeah. I know they threw everyone a curveball and not and not having Poison the Well on there and everyone. Oh yeah, I'm so I'm so happy they're playing. They're there now. <laughs> yeah, no, they're, they're there now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yep, I'm so glad they got back on. Yeah, that's a big one, man. You know, they like like you guys. They they also kind of help mold that whole metalcore scene. Oh yeah, and um, they're just a you know they're a band that I could I hope they kind of not get it together, but they all kind of at some point want to start playing again. I, I really, mm-hmm. I really do hope that uh, they're, they're one of my favorite bands. And I like a lot of those bands from back in those early, you know, metalcore years, just like yourself. So it'd be really good to have like another pillar back. You know what I mean? Cause Oh yeah. Certain bands, like you said, well, dude, every time I die and everything, they, they still, yeah, I couldn't, I can't believe that Caven's like back. Yeah. I'm still like in shock that Caven's like legitimately back. <laughs> yeah. They're doing, they're doing some stuff. Well, I mean, they were, they were, Caven wasn't. Caven was playing a little bit before even the first yeah. fest thing. Yeah, they were. They were. Conference. They. Yeah. They. They released a new record and they were like playing shows. Um, so <laughs> yeah, the fact that they're like kind of back as a band is really exciting. And, yeah. And yeah, all the. I mean, every dude, all that stuff. Like, we're such fans of all of it. You know, like there's so many bands that I really like, and, and honestly, too, like just people. Like, I think all of us are really. I, I, I just love meeting new people, hanging out with old friends, like all that stuff's so important. Yeah. You know, there was, there's, there's gotta be something said about those early festivals. Cause like, if we, re- if we really want to think about it, I mean, you would know more so than probably anyone in, in this chat here, Scott, but how was it run? Like, it, it seems like it was just a bunch of like young 20 somethings booking these shows. Right that would be day long festivals with all these bands. And it, it was really like, to me, when I look back, it was ahead of its time. Cause then like the festival scene started becoming a big thing, but that was 10 years plus after like Hellfest and after, mm-hmm. you know, Furnace Fest and Cornerstone and all these other festivals yeah. that hardcore and metal were already kind of doing. Yeah. I, I kind of feel the same way. Like it, it almost felt like it was a cluster fuck all the time, but <laughs> for some weird reason, it always worked out. Yeah. Um, And I think the, the most recent show or the most recent festival that we did that felt how the old festivals feel was probably, this is hardcore in Philly. Cause like, not that it was, I mean, those guys are on it. Like it's definitely like 
done unbelievably well, but it felt how those old festivals were. Cause like, I don't know, there's some, like we've played new England metal fest, right. And new England metal fest, when we first started playing them, were pretty open, pretty cool. And like everything would be like, it didn't, maybe the difference for me is this, like it didn't matter what, what stage you played. It didn't matter how big your band was. Everybody was sort of like an, an equal. So like you could walk around and like the headliner of that day, you would probably just see hanging out outside. Yeah. And then all of a sudden all this shit happens. And like now fucking whatever bands so big that's headlining metal fest, like they're, you're not allowed near the stage when they play, or you're not allowed near their dressing room. Dude, we're playing three ahead of you. How the fuck are we not allowed? <laughs> yeah, like, right. So like that kind of shit has always driven me nuts. And, and I think this is hardcore was one of those festivals where like, it didn't matter what stature your band was. Like if you were a headliner, or if you were an opener, like everybody had the same place to set their merch up. Everybody had the same place to hang out. That's the kind everybody of everybody literally like. used the same gear. Yeah, they everybody all had used the same yes. gear. They're like, yep. we have a back line. You walk and on. This is what you Drummers doing. bring your snare, your cymbals. These are the yep. amps. Go. Nice. And yes. Like everybody was in the same boat, and it yep. was it was one of the easiest, most stress free yeah. festivals <laughs> I played ever, ever, yes. yep. ever. Yep. So we're and hoping, but, but I think fest will be like kind of that vibe but 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 i think that goes back to that and i think to me you know on the other side of it watching furnace fest over the years to me like furnace fest was this thing that it's always seemed to me like it was sort of cobbled together by accident at the beginning and yeah. ended up being like this huge thing and it never lost that spirit yeah and I would say almost I would almost argue that I think for a lot of bands, Furnace Fest is what made them. Yeah. Like, you know, because of just the, the this this massive community descending on this one place. And it and then all those people like going back to wherever they were from, like, and then taking that band back with them. Um and everybody just in that era and that scene, like something like Furnace Fest, like like you said, Scott, like those kind of shows, that was the biggest show you played. And then the next yeah. couple of nights you're playing to 20 people in, yep. you know, a, ba a barn or a VFW or <laughs> a house show or whatever it happened to be. And I think what changed in the scene later on was when everybody, you had those couple bands that really broke it. Like there's bands that really like people like Under Oath or you know, I don't think they were ever really part of the the Furnace thing, but like some a band like Andrew Chelsea. WK. These are well, <laughs> yeah. Andrew WK was always destined for greatness because <laughs> yes, I mean, that's just on. a that's a, that's a mem that's a yeah, memory on the DVD and anything like that. You know, it was a big. It, I think it was a big people moment for the fest. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was a anything Andrew WK does is a big moment for anybody. <laughs> um, but what ended up happening was all these bands that like things like Furnace Fest that were, and I'm not, I'm not saying this about like Under Oath or Kill Switch or any of the bands that got really big that were from that era and that it became the, every, there, there were certain like labels and people in the industry that were like, we want this all the time. And then bands were like, oh, so this other, like these bands, like, they're playing these huge shows all the time. They're like selling all these records. And it, it became this thing where for ages, like is some of these bands from that scene, you were happy to sell 10,000 records and play to 200 people a night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Like that's all anyone ever expected. Yeah. <laughs> and then like, I, I remember we were on that, like, uh, I forget what tour we were on. It was when that one under oath record came out and they like got to like number two on billboard. And I remember all the band, like some of the other bands on the tour that we were on the tour with at the time were like, oh man, like, how are we ever going to live up to this? And I'm like, why do you feel you need to? Yeah. Like, I, I think that's what changed in the industry. And, the, and that's a big thing I noticed between hardcore festivals and stuff like Furnace or even This Is Hardcore and metal fests is that at metal festivals, there's a lot of ego. Yeah. Everyone's like, oh, I'm a star. I'm yeah, a, I could get that. And a I bit. think something like Furnace Fest, 
at Furnace Fest, everybody, a lot of these bands that are coming back and doing this stuff, they're just like, this is what made us. That's mm -hmm. why we're coming back. Yeah. That's why you see Andrew WK coming back. It's like, he's like, I'm going to go play Furnace Fest because that was a good scene. And that was part of my development. It was a fun time. You know, yeah. there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with getting big. And there's nothing yeah. wrong with having these like great shows. But I, I think the difference of why Furnace Fest, like that thing kind of died a lot of the agents weren't letting bands play those kind of things. Hmm. That's you know, an interesting like it, take. Yeah. This whole, they're just like, well, you know, you can go to this furnace fest thing, but we're going to send you on this pay to play. You know, the label's like, oh, you can't do that because you're on Ozfest this year. And we're right. paying for it. Right. right. <laughs> you know, like, it did. It was like that weird time period around that, like when furnace fest stopped, like 2004 ish around that time period where like MTV started taking like, oh, that like, cause obviously it was getting popular at that time. The internet was also getting popular. MySpace was getting popular. The scene was really big on MySpace. Bands were all over. And of course, OzFest kind of, they had that show and, you know, the Osbournes did the thing. And it was like, yeah, the pay to play kind of started stealing everything up, especially from like our little world. So uh, I always kind of hated MTV for that. And then it, it, it turned it into like, you would see dudes dressed up on next, like that show next or whatever, the dating show. And they would be some bastardized yeah. version of like a scene kid. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And it became like a joke, but, you know, it almost came like I, a joke. But I mean, here's the thing. A lot of, a lot of the, you know, labels and the people behind some of these bands were pushing that kind of stuff. Mm. Like that, that became the thing. It's like, you know, like some of the, and I'm, I'm not, naming any names and, and no one's i mean no one's at fault for this you know but it was like you know all of a sudden selling you know 30 or fifty thousand records of abrasive you know metallic hardcore wasn't good enough because this other band went gold mm. so you you know now you have to achieve that or you failed and, yeah. and that it really took a toll on a lot of bands that felt that if they weren't doing that, they were failing. That is an interesting and that was, insight. And that was something that, like, that was when we started, that was kind of when we stopped touring because we're just like, we're not doing that. Like, mm -hmm. we didn't really, we, we didn't want to be a part of that. We're like, yeah. we want to do what we're doing. Like, and, you know, like, that, that, we're, that we're, is we're not going to feel guilty because we're not having a gold record. <laughs> that was never the goal. It definitely is an interesting insight into like, you know, looking back, because obviously we can all we can all look back now and kind of piece everything together as to why things went the way they have. And like I say this with newer bands that I have on the podcast, it's it's nice that I, I feel like there is a resurgence of kind of like the metalcore scene in general, like heavy music is kind of getting a, another win here. Uh, another wind here. And so there was like a lull and I kind of attribute that lull starting with that kind of like bastardization of the scene in general. And then it became like a kind of a joke thing. And then people stopped, you know, I, I don't know, like you said, the metalhead thing is also a thing and it, it's different than like the hardcore scene used to be when I was a kid. So, yep. uh, but um, yeah, so coming back to the festival thing, this is hardcore. Is, I haven't checked that out yet because obviously I live I live in Florida. If you were, oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't awesome. tell you that. So where are you, where are you at in Florida? North Florida. I actually uh, had Yashir on the podcast. Uh, guys that you've had oh, a split with. So dude, we had Luke and uh, Dan on. Yeah. Love, love them. Love, love, love them. Yeah. Speaking of which, I'll just ask you that question. You you guys do splits with certain bands. What? What is like? What's the caliber? Of, like, what's the what's the checklist of like? How do we get? How does a band get on a Zao split? You know what I'm saying? Like, what are, what are the, what's the checklist? We have to like them. But, <laughs> we have to. Yeah, like we just them. like it. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, because you guys is literally it. We're like, we really like this band, and we're. You've done it with a couple yeah. big ones, you know, uh, Ludacris before they were Norma Jean. You had um, the Bleeding Through one, and then yeah, it was just interesting that you guys had the Yashira one a couple years ago too. <laughs> yeah, we just we saw we, them. We have, a, we have a couple other things too that we we can't talk about yet, but we have some ideas. Yeah, and a discussion with them involved. No, different bands. Oh, okay, okay, okay. It'll be a surprise. It'll be a surprise. Yeah, but like I remember, it was literally just this. We played 
some Florida shows. Yashir was on the shows. We didn't really, like, we got to listen to them and our, um, whatever, the booking agent, we were like, yeah, we like them, put them on, whatever. And then, like, I remember me, Dan, and Jeff watching them going, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, we were so just mesmerized by them. Yeah. And then the whole, like, the whole tour, you just like, dude, we fucking love your band. <laughs> so that's it. I mean. Yeah, man. no, it's. We talked about it when they were on the podcast. It was like, it's crazy. And it's like, kind of like cool how like they just like, cause uh, Pete from Remembering Never does Ether Coven mm-hmm. now. And yeah, yeah. Which we love them too. Yeah. yeah and we have big fans Pete's of those too. Friend, yeah. Man. yeah, obviously, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seems, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, this band, this younger band from here, you know, Pete loves them. You guys love them. So it's weird yeah. how like they ever get in their little feelers just out into like mm-hmm. you know the world but no it was cool and i was wondering what you know what led to that because i asked them what led to it you know so i to get your side was yeah, yeah we yeah, just love them I mean, yeah any anytime we're doing shows basically our our booking agent will be like here's the bands that that i think will fit and that are interested and we go through and we listen and then we're like okay this is number one choice you know, and a lot of times, like I said, like, we'll, we'll listen to like, yeah, this band will fit with us. And I remember doing that with Yashira, and I didn't think anything of it. I'm like, yeah, they sound good. And then when we saw them live, we were just all blown away. Oh, yeah. Like, just absolutely blown away. Like, they, well, they're, they're on to something really special. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's another Jacksonville band you guys, re- I mean, you play with a couple, but, you know, you play with Evergreen, too. They're another Jacksonville oh, we, band. Mm-hmm. Yep. Great. Love those dudes, too. One of that's, our favorite I, bands to tour with. <laughs> yeah. Well, dude, that's the thing about with us, like, I, I hate, I, I always feel like such a dick saying this kind of thing, but like, dude, we, there's just no ego with us, man. None of us. Like, we literally just want to help anybody we can. We hope we get the favor back if people could help us. And that's always what I felt. Like, that. I think all of us look at playing music, it, like, you have to have a community that all, everybody works together. There's no, like... Oh, they're bigger, bum, we're bummed out. But like, dude, I just want to be f- friends with every band we can be friends with. I want to like be as cool as humanly possible to every person that deserves to be I, us to be cool with, and build, you know, relationships and friendships. Like that's like everybody that we work with now, um, every person that's involved. Like it's just we've made sure that that they're like legitimate friendships. Like every everything that we do, we make sure that everybody that we just stay in contact with them and go out of our way to make sure that it's just always cool. And I don't, I, I think there's a lot of bands that do that, but I, to me, I don't know why you'd even want to do this kind of thing without that mentality. Like I, I, I never understood being a headliner for a tour and like being shitty to opening bands. Like yeah. why? If you don't, if you didn't want them to play or if you didn't like them, why did you let them on the show in the first place? Like yep. to me, I would just rather be friends with everybody. So it's whatever. easier. It's easier that way. Um, yeah, like I, dude. Wh- and who are you? Like, who gives a shit? Yeah, right. <laughs> like literally, you're no. Like nobody's nobody, man. Like I'm nobody. I I got to. I'm so lucky that I get to even play music in front of anybody. So like, I, I never. I could never get it. I just never get it. Well, it's a it's a something that people uh, in the scene and everywhere have to deal with it's not just you know lo- not just with us in the hardcore yeah scene. not true absolutely um, so i probably can't let you guys go without asking you jeff um since you obviously can't talk about the zeo stuff with the splits of the other bands coming up <laughs> maybe you can kind of like you know toss a little uh, fat and nugget our way is there any from Ooh. autumn ashes kind of things coming out since you guys are playing furnace fest um, right. Do you guys have any anything planned for you know specials? Uh, specials, not um, specials. Like, do you have any uh, new music? Let's just say it out loud. New music. Yeah, we're writing. Nice. There's writing happening. There's writing. Um, and I, I feel safe saying this because I know. I think Bri- Brian Deneve just did a, a podcast recently, and he talked about it so I, I i don't feel like i'm leaving the cat out of the bag but yes we are writing and there are some songs nice and i think the play i think it one or two of them the plan was to play them at furnace fest 
Uh, that might be the first time people hear a new From Honor to Ashes song. Um, but I, there are songs. In demo stage, uh, it's happening. Um, now, what that means, we don't know. We're not mm. talking about album. We're just, just like, let's write some songs. Toss some ideas. And, I mean, maybe it'll be three or four songs that we finish up and they come out, whatever. It's digital singles, whatever. We don't know. There's no plan. Cool. Uh, we're playing it real, real casual. Well, we... Um, <clears throat> We definitely probably should get, you know, you and Francis on or you and someone else from the band and we'll spend uh Fran, Fran, Fran's a hard guy to track down, but I can try. <laughs> no, nah, but we can, you know, we can get you, we can get you guys on and spend spend some time talking about that band because that also is a band from way back when. Uh so yeah, it'd be it'd be interesting to go down memory lane with both of you guys again. But um outside of that, man, I think we've I mean, we didn't cover everything by all means, but I don't want to keep you all night. Uh so um but yeah, other than the record coming Wait, out, go ahead, Jeff. Did you have any good questions from your uh, when people when you were farm, I'm always were farming out I'm very questions? hesitant. We all right. I mean, we could. We'll I, run I'll through take, it. We'll, we'll run through it. Couple. We'll run through it. How about that? I'm very hesitant. We're up for things. a challenge. We're up for a challenge. I'm only going to do it because you guys are Lamb Goat alums, so you know what to expect. We're not. Yeah, nothing is going to offend us, dude. Dude, nothing. We have, we have, <laughs> I, I have I have posted some of the most brutal stuff about Zayo anonymously on the Lamb Goat comments. So, hey. Yeah, good stuff. Were you bummed that we took the anonymous <laughs> comments away so you have to log with your Facebook now and everyone knows it's you? you well, see, I, that, yeah. Once once the comments disappeared from the articles, I was just like, ah, because even the, the the forum that's too much for me. I can't. I can't. Oh man, you got to come I, play I on that battle. I have a. I have a screen name over there. I, I just haven't logged into it for a while. Oh my god! And I'll never, I'll never say what it is. I would be interested to know what it is. That's what I'll say. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, I was gonna say if you haven't, if you're just listening to this, come on, come play oh, yeah. on the playground. Come, come to the <laughs> forum on Lango. Come play on the playground. Uh, I have to tell you guys, these are right. by far the most responses we have gotten from any of these IG question things. So okay. cool. again, fair warning. I have not. They're pro- and they're probably terrible. Oh, right. I have not oh, even gross. read Perfect. any of these. Handle. All right. Someone said we should talk about the penis tie. Oh, from all of so them. I yes. I, I okay. I don't even. I don't remember <laughs> why that thing looked like a dick. Um, but honestly, back then, like it was very rare that we had. Well, even now, like, dude, we like get artists to do covers because we like them so we don't like say you have to do this but i think that was a clark brothers design and i don't even know who mentioned that the tie looked like a dick but we all wanted it just to stay a dick and they they changed it Mm. (laughs) bummer um this is big bummer this is one that says def ask about your size of your balls because you have melons so that's just probably him telling you you guys have big balls. Cool. Uh, that's probably Marty. <laughs> yeah. Um, when is the fear uh, the fear on vinyl going to be? Is that a thing going to happen or? Uh, uh, soon. Okay. T-shirts. Soon. T-shirts I, of this. Oh, go ahead. Finish your thing. I don't want to cut that off. No, 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 no. Go ahead. No, no. no I was no. just going to say very soon. That's okay. all I'll say. Cool. Yeah. That's all I know. Um, t-shirts of the self-released titled album, please. Oh, uh, like self-titled? You mean? Mm-hmm. T-shirts of what, the self-titled we, album. When when we when we get to that one on a reissue, why yeah, not? we might. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not opposed. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of religious ones in here. God was. One <laughs> That's of okay. Things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Depends it, on what it is, I mean. right? No, yeah. dude, just just shoot. We might have a no, mind blowing answer. It just says, it just says God. That's all it says as the top. Oh, it just says bring God? up God. Yeah, just bring up God. Oh, okay. Bring up God. Nothing okay. God. Uh, <laughs> will you ever play UK Europe again once the vaccines are rolled out? I we would. I I mean, sure. we want to do everything. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we'd love to do everything. Uh, how many lineup changes has the band had? Seventeen thousand. Yeah, we already kind of went into nah, that. No, I mean, there's what? Not like, as dude, many as you think. Not, not as many. Actually, Wikipedia Earth, is more. very wrong. Yes. Napalm Death had more. Napalm yeah, they, they, Death they, had more. Yeah. They definitely had a. Napalm Death. 
Napalm Death couldn't keep the same lineup from side A to side B <laughs> of their first album. The B side has a different lineup than the A side. <laughs> it was recorded. The band broke time. up oh, yeah. as you flip the record. <laughs> we should have brought that up with Barney. Um, how do you keep things fresh writing uh, albums after so many albums? Because you do have like an extensive discography at this point. We just do whatever the fuck we want. Because I th- that's it. I mean, Not honestly. Care. Yeah, you can't worry about it. Like you just, because it, I, I'm going to be writing anyway. So if I get to write something that somebody else gets to hear, cool. But if I like write something and it's just my dumb thing that I get to listen to, <laughs> I, yeah, we don't look at it. Like I'm just, we just keep writing. Um, so how do you feel? I don't know if necessarily this guy, this is geared to both you guys, but Scott, maybe you can elaborate a little bit. How do you guys sure. feel about being one of the most influential bands of the nineties? Oh, I don't even think we are, but, um, I mean, we like, we were influenced by so much of what was happening. There's so many bands that are super influential. I think I can't, I don't even think of it like that. Yeah. I think of it like we were lucky to be in a time when we were, we got to build like a scene. So like, but the scene influenced us and like all these other bands influenced us and like straight up like metal bands that existed before anybody even thought there was going to be anything influenced us carcass influenced <laughs> like everything. So like, I don't know. I, I, I guess I, I, it's hard for me to look at it that way. Sure. Um, is Croatone about the colony that disappeared? I don't know if you would know that if, if Dan's told you. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's yeah, the, the disappearing Croatone, the colony that disappeared in Croatone, it, it is a, that is the starting point. Yes. Cool. The but song also, isn't exactly about that, it, but that's the, that's the, the world that it lives in. Yeah. It's because it delves into like mental, like illnesses and, like the whole record, I think, has a lot to do with, with that kind of like, like personal mental situations and and all that kind of stuff. And I think that Dan kind of used that story as like a metaphor for the disassociation you feel. Like there's a lot of cool things going on, but but that was definitely a beginning point. That story. Cool. <clears throat> were the were the streets really paved in gold? I wouldn't know. <laughs> um what are i mean again this might be I like a, i do i, I do like the god just like just bring up god because yeah i mean that was gonna ha- i mean we're it's gonna happen yeah well i'm surprised we haven't like because so zayo hasn't been like i'm like pretty militantly like atheist <laughs> but but like the band hasn't been that for so long it's but the funny part for me is, like, I love that people still talk about it. It's crazy. Yeah, because, like, I mean, obviously, like, it was more probably the earlier version of the band in general. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. So, like, dude, we, we talked about this before. Like, Blood and Fire has some brutal shit that Dan's talking about. Like, it's not really. And Liberate is, like, very not centered around that stuff like there's some i mean is, some... is the big is is the big is the big jc i don't think the big jc is even mentioned on liberate no at all yeah i don't ever think... never not a word or self yeah. any of them yeah honestly the the most the most christian lyrics on blood and fire were not written by dan hmm. yeah boom <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> they were left out. That I think there's there's a, one or two songs that I think were technically Sean Jonas lyrics that were left over. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Most of the the some of the big lies of serpents and ravage ritual are actually very anti like religious organized yeah. religion. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy yeah. how like like that stigma will just continue to follow you throughout the time. And it's fair. I mean, dude, like don't. Trust me, we're not lost on the whole stupid like weirdness of it. Like we definitely get it. Like the band started out full on spirit filled religious, and Dan and Russ. I mean, it wasn't like those guys came in and were like not that. So it's not like offensive to even hear about it or like we totally get why people would still peg us that it's a bummer. But like <laughs> I think that you know if you listen to shit now, like it's God for God damn for sure. <laughs> that, that's not. 
Yeah. <laughs> no, what's up? Um, again, we already talked about the the pioneers of the middle course scene, so we can skip that question. I, again, you may not know the answer to this one, but what are the lyrics to Suspension Suspend about? Oh, uh, it's that's a pretty right. brutal personal one. Okay. I mean, it, it's but I th- definitely... I think, I think Dan's talked about it. Yeah, yeah. I think it was... It's a, it's a friend of his that uh, committed suicide. Mm. And his way of dealing with... And, dude, it's... You know, the man... Dan has had so much death in his life. So a lot of the songs kind of... A lot of his lyrics... And, do kind of talk about how he gets through some of that stuff. Cause he's had, we, I mean, we've all had a lot of friends that have done that, but like Dan, I mean, there's so many people, so many like very like crucial people in his life that, that that's happened to. So, but that one was, yeah, that's, that's about a friend's suicide. All right. This ask about Jesse being a Scientologist. What the fuck? Well, no, I, actually, I don't, I don't know that he no, here's, he? but here, no, no, he's, I, no, no, no. But, <laughs> Jesse, we actually, all of us have an unbelievably great relationship now. So, and Jesse has like, he's like, if anything, probably more like meditative, like Buddhist sort of like, really like, like really focused guy now. Like, it's pretty impressive to see like, because I I mean, he was struggling with a lot of stuff back when we were touring and all that. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of depression that that I think got just not paid attention to because we were kids and we didn't understand it. Um, but but I think what I've seen of Jesse now and like just now that we talk pretty regularly, um, no, he's definitely not a Scientologist, but he's he's for sure like different. Got him, yeah. He got himself in a really awesome place that's really inspiring, actually. And I don't know exactly why they want what they want. F- out of this, but they're the same <laughs> person. The same person asks, um, just and about Norma Jean kind of getting canceled. I guess what you're oh, thoughts with that is well, dude, fun. I'm just, like, okay, let's whatever. The dude, ah, oh, the dude said dumb shit. Like, I hate this whole cancel thing. Like, if you say dumb shit, we have I have every right not to listen to you anymore. Why can't I just not listen? Like, it's not even canceling. Like, when you say stupid shit you have to understand that there are consequences for saying stupid shit. And, and, and again, too, stupid shit is relative. Like, sure. you know, there's people that quit listening to us because we said, well, we're not a Christian band. They're like, I'll never yeah. buy your records again. It's yeah, like, we, we got canceled. canceled by that. <laughs> Those people, like, who, it's all relative. Like, whatever. Um, yeah, I, but did it, they it's, really get canceled? Well, uh, Corey's so been laying it, very low. Corey. Yeah, Corey's Corey, been laying very low. Well, because we'll do okay. So, from what I understand of the whole thing, the guy like made a joke about like when there was pretty high tension, yeah, with the police brutality stuff, and he like he he did say something that was pretty obviously like I mean, he, I think he came back and apologized for it, and then he also said that it he didn't mean it that way. Well, I mean, it's pretty blatant when you see what he said. So I think what I don't like about this is like, there are things that people say and I'm sorry, like, no, but like the government is canceling you. Like that's <laughs> free speech to me is you're not going to get arrested for saying something dumb, but like, I'm not going to fucking listen to you anymore. Yeah. And, and like, people are going to call you out. Like that isn't any, that that's how it's always been. Like if you and say here's something the thing that I find, Ahead, I find this really interesting too, because I, there a lot of people were making a big deal about how every time I die, I made a comment about how they wouldn't play any festivals or shows that Nor- they, Norma yeah. Jean was on. And they made a comment within that statement. They said, this is an ongoing rule. They yeah. already had that rule before, before. what he did. Wow. And yep. I can tell you full on, and I'm not, a, I don't care. I'm not embarrassed about this. And it was had nothing to do with what he said, and it's not cancellation. We were offered a tour with Norma Jean at one point that recently, within the past few years, before this happened, and we turned it down because not because of what he said, just because the general vibe. And I remember talking to a couple guys in the band, 
And the general vibe was like, I just don't want anything to do with that guy. Yeah. So this is a long running thing about people in the scene in the... Are you talking about certain people of the band or just the band in general? Well, like the st- certain, certain people. Certain okay. people in Zayo or whatever don't want anything to do with him. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got you. So, and here's, here's like the thing. That, this is, has nothing to do with whatever comment he made on the Black Lives Matter. Right, right. Thing. It's just like a this thing that's going over on. the years. Right. This had yeah. been going yeah. on for several years. Interesting. And about okay. Also, what, what drives me out of my mind. So, like, everybody acts like, well, conservatives are being canceled, right? <laughs> well, dude, I will happily debate anyone on the economics of what, like, conservatism and liberalism or, or progressivism would be like, I'm, I'm fine. We can have debates where like we come from a reasonable place. When you say shitty things, that's not, you don't, you can't expect people to be okay to listen to you. Like nobody's I mean, maybe canceling. They are, but who cares? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> d- nobody's canceling you being a conservative, but like when you're like overtly being a shithead, uh, dude, you're good. People are going to not listen to you. Yeah. And they're going to, they're going to come at you and they're going to come after you. Like, I, I don't know why you wouldn't think you, you're going to say something. You've got to be ready to take the, the responsibility of what you're going to say. The internet. And, you, and you may, and you may find a new crowd. You might sure. find the people that agree with what you said. And now you have this, that's fine. Well, that's dude, fine. You, I guarantee you. People read are gonna, the room. Yeah. People are, gonna, people are going to listen to this and they're going to be like, Oh, well, Looks like Zayo's, what are they called? Uh, social justice. Social justice. Warrior. Yeah, we're, dude, no, like, we've never wanted to hear bullshit. Like, I don't want to hear that kind of talk. I don't, we, like, all of us in the band have always been this way. Like, there's nothing new to, like, this whole, like, last five years of, like, how this cancel culture thing has happened. Like, there are things about, to me, like, free speech that, like I'm an absolutist for that. I think people should be able to say whatever they want. That doesn't mean consequences don't happen to you. Right. What that does mean is that uh, the government is not going to come in. There's not going to be a police officer at your door the next day going, well, you said this, so you're going to jail. But what could happen is your whole fan base doesn't agree with you. And guess what? They don't like you anymore. Right. I'm and curious. I, yeah, to and, and that's, that's been from the beginning of time, yeah. you know? Yes. You that's, that's how it's your, always been. If you piss off your audience or your, your customer base, they're mm-hmm. going to quit buying your product. Yeah. yeah. Like like Coke, with Twitter. In the, 80s, in the 80s, Coke changed their formula and everyone quit <laughs> buying it. Like, and it worked. Coke wasn't canceled. This is like, we yeah. don't like what you're doing. We're not buying it anymore. Yeah. And they changed the formula back. And, I like how we you know, associate so- the Norma Jean thing with the Coke changing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a good, that's a good one. But um, well, I mean, if you have enough people to like the new Norma Jean stance or whatever, then yeah, go do your thing. It's one of those it's things fine. where it's like the internet and social media and, <clears throat> you know, doing things like this where in my, in the back of my head, like, you know, when I'm interviewing bands like, like you guys, you know, we're documenting some kind of like scene history in the back of my, sure. you know, dream like mine. So, but it's, it's, it's interesting to find out these things about the behind the scenes stuff. Like where you don't necessarily know, I don't want I don't want to keep using Corey as an example, but you don't ex, you don't know who these people are outside of just mm-hmm. seeing them on the internet or hearing them over the you know in the music and stuff like that. But it's also kind of a bummer when you find out that certain people that you may you know have liked or looked up to as a, a you know a fan, you know, R. Kelly status. You don't you know, you can't vibe with R. Kelly after you find out yeah. everything he's done. It's like you know. It's, it's a bummer. It's a bummer. But, it, you know, the internet, I think, will weed everything out. And I know people hate the kinds of culture and everything like that, but it is doing some positive as well as some negatives. You know, it's not a... Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are definitely times where where things get a little bit overblown, sure. Mm-hmm. But, like, but I think oh, the overall feeling of, like, hey, guess what? Like, we're finally getting the... Pe- like, you can't say this kind of shit anymore. You can't be this kind of that that type of vibe isn't going to work with us. Like I, I actually like the thought of these people that have been. I don't even know how to say it. I, like I'm trying to think of the best way to explain it. But like, there are things that I think don't belong in a in a in an area where, and I think that the overall like scene that we, we live in is, is, is more progressive. So you have to recognize that. 
you know, and I, I think that it's always been that way. Like counterculture is that, mm-hmm. you know, where, you know, people are fighting for everyone to have the same like rights and equality is a huge, important thing. So, and it should be <laughs> like, that's actually something that we should be striving for all the time. So, you know, if you have different, nobody's saying you can't have different viewpoints, but when your viewpoints are so backwards to what, what, what I think like, is so obviously justifiable, you know, like you want like the black lives matter thing. Like that shouldn't even have be like a, a weird thing for people. <laughs> yeah, no, I get like, are you, are you really, are you serious? Like I get, it's real easy to go back and like, look at all the different situations that have happened. But like, if you can't recognize that like black people get treated differently and that has to stop, then why are you in this scene? Or why are you even like, like as an artist, like I think most artists would look at that and go like, we want everybody to, to be the same. I, I want everybody to have that same opportunity. And, and you can recognize like how people haven't had certain opportunities. If you, I, it's, it blows my fucking mind. Oh, no, no. It I always I mean, will. We got, we got, we got shit. I remember when the th- there was the big thing, which we ended up pulling it down because of, uh, not because of the personal, but I remember there was the one thing where everyone was doing the social media blackout during Black oh, Lives yeah. Matter. And I pulled it down up. for a different reason, and it, well, it had nothing to do. Um, but I remember people were giving a shit for it, and I'm like, we literally have a black guy in the band. <laughs> like they yeah. were just like, oh, jumping on the bandwagon. I'm like, our like fr- like lifelong friend is one of these people, right? Yeah, like, like dude, you know, this like, is. Oh. Like, are you kidding me? Like, I know. Like, oh, you're jumping on the social justice. Like, no, like we, we have personally toured with and like I have toured with and without Russ. And I see the difference about how we get treated in certain areas of the country. Sure. We walk in when Russ is there versus when Russ is not there. Like, I I, I, we we personally have witnessed this stuff. For sure. Yeah, it's everywhere. For, For sure. We can't, we can't end this bad boy on that. I'm, I'm just going to go through the rest of these yeah. questions. I'm sure we're going to go on yeah, some go side tangents, but uh, that way we're not just in doom and gloom all day long. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. What was the most, uh, personally, what was the most inspirational thing you witnessed slash learned in the pandemic? Wow. The most inspirational. Uh, wow. I how would say, oh, go ahead, go ahead, if you have one. Uh, honestly, how important interaction with other people is. Like, you really take all of that for granted. You take all of it for granted. Because you think, oh, well, I'll just see my friend next tomorrow. I think, like, not being able to have that easily, like, interaction with other people is really, really detrimental to, like, to people to yourself you know that, that was kind of where i was going too like, yeah. yeah that was the big thing yeah I think, Just a lot, that. I think a lot of people have that yeah i think it's pretty i think everyone i mean the fact that you couldn't be you know you take for granted like being able to just go to your parents house and like yeah. have dinner and it was like you know when this first started there were what three or four months that you just couldn't do that yeah some people are still not doing that yeah, which is totally understandable. Like I, you know, we we see our family sparingly. Um, we're still, you know, we wear the masks around them and because they're a little older, so we're really careful with that stuff. But but yeah, like all of that, man. Holy shit! Like not the ease of interaction you take for granted so much. Hmm. Best and worst things about touring slash playing shows in your forties. Ooh. Uh, I don't know. It, it's weird. Like I actually enjoy traveling and playing shows more now than I did in say my thirties. I'd have to agree. I, Cause I think we've got, uh, we've gotten better at it. Like, and like we've gotten better at understanding how to travel comfortably. And it makes sense. <clears throat> Yeah, like we've just gotten better at running the shows and better at like 
cutting out bullshit that we don't need and learning to enjoy ourselves in relaxing ways. Does well, that's, I think that a big thing. Sense. Yeah. I think the big thing for me is like when you're doing it, how we were before in, in my twenties and in my thirties, like, I think you don't actually really appreciate it because you think it's just going to be there. And then with our age now, and we we've, I mean, we've self-inflicted our, like our own stopping. So that's one thing, but like, man, I just appreciate the fact that we can still get to play. So like now when we go out and play, I soak everything in. Like I, there's, there's never really a time that I get into, like my, I'm not in a bad mood ever because like, I just appreciate the ability to do it. And, and I think that like all of us have that same, like, man, we just, we're so happy that we get to still do this. And I mean, you got to take care of yourself a little bit better because yeah. you're older, <laughs> but that's, you know, that's about it. Turn it into- we also play when we also play when we want to and how often we want to. So we never feel like, cause we don't have a record label to answer to mm-hmm. or anybody. Cause we are, are we are the label. Mm-hmm. So it's a totally different vibe. And so we do what we're comfortable with. Like, Good. Best beers during COVID. Yeah. That's Best a follow beers? Yeah, that's a follow-up question to the same question. Ooh. Um, see, that's the thing. I actually had a, I've had a beer drought since COVID. Okay, well, that could be your uh, answer. Because, because most of my hookups for beers, which were places around Brooklyn that I frequented, I can't go to. Mm. So oh, right. I was, I was, I ended up I ended up being like, what does the the corner bodega or whatever, you know, the grocery store near me have on stock? Luckily, some of my grocery stores have some Brooklyn or New York area, you know, beers, craft beer yeah. stuff on hand. But it's usually like the, the stuff that you would normally get. I uh, gotcha. Honestly, I've been I drinking. Mean, I, cook- I hate to <laughs> I hate to toot our own horn. <laughs> yeah. Do our beer? Yeah. Holy crap. I mean, I I hate to toot our own horn, but yeah, our beer that we just did. uh, Yeah, it's pretty sick. But dude, funny, all I've been drinking recently is Corona. (laughs) So I don't know why. (laughs) It's cheaper, you know Um, what I mean? They got some bad marketing out there right now. (laughs) And it's, yeah, it's kind of whatever. But yeah, the Croatoan beer that, oh my gosh. Oh, well, it's unfair too, because we like all got to like taste it out and had like everything that we all loved in one beer. And it like it was the weirdest thing ever because all of us agreed for the, on like everything. I'll have to try so. it. I'll have to try it out. I don't really do it's, craft beers oh, that often, delicious. but I'll, I'll definitely try it. Um, do you guys still have your CDs in Christian bookstores? I would assume. No, some of the uh, catalog. No, I don't think. I don't think. And here's why I don't think. I don't think any of the any of the older albums are all out of print. Anything. Uh, everything is pretty much out of print. Uh, all the solid state stuff, even the ferret stuff, it's out of print. You can't get it. Will there be a reissue for this, for any of those stuff, for any of those, uh, for any of those releases? Have they been bought up by any bigger label or anything like that with ferret? Yeah. All the, all the solid state stuff is owned by capital. All the ferret stuff is owned by Warner. Uh, but the physical, they, they, there are no physical CDs floating around unless they're extras left over. Um, I know. I've been trying to find stuff. them. We do not. We do not. We do not push it. In fact, when we were on fair, the fear came out. We were pretty much blacklisted from the Christian bookstores, which so. is good. Yeah. yeah, that's how we wanted it. So whatever. They, well, they, they, <laughs> the, the, the Christian bookstores offered if we said we were a Christian band, they would put the record. In. We just had to say we were. Didn't matter what was on the record, and we're like, wait, wait, wait. So you're a Christian distributor, and you're telling us if we lie. <laughs> we'll sell it to your people. Well, we know you have a market like, here. Yeah, so we can profit off of and that. And we probably would have sold a lot more records doing that. But we, we're like, no, that's that's not we, yeah. that's not that's not very Christian of you. Especially especially if people still are confused on if you're a Christian band or not, you know, you would definitely have pulled in a little more sales. Uh speaking of which, having knowledge of the sacred text. Do you believe we are, do you believe we have been and or are in the end of times? Jesus Christ. 
Oops. I mean, I mean, literally. <laughs> uh, dude, if you if one, I can't get past the whole sacred text thing. I'm still lost <laughs> on that. <one. laughs> uh, yeah. If the you, chosen bands, I mean, the chosen bands get the sacred text given to them. You know what I mean? Oh, is that <laughs> what it is? I have a bridge to sell you too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, the, I, I would say that I thought the end of time stuff was overblown, but I mean, what we've been witnessing recently is pretty. I mean, if you wanted to sell me a conspiracy theory right now about the end of times, I might start <laughs> raising an eyebrow a little bit. Like, I don't know, maybe. Cool. The last one. But that doesn't... <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Jeff. No, nothing. No, just I'm still trying to wrap my head around that last one. Again, I like I said, I'm not. I didn't read these prior, so I'm just shooting. No, no, that's head. we like. I'm so in. Okay. Keep so the last one, uh, we've kind of touched base on a lot of the things that people asked, um, but the last one is this was specifically for Dan. So I don't know if you guys could answer this one, but has he ever done? Has he ever done a Zao tattoo in his shop? Yes, <laughs> actually, I can tell you the sickest one he's ever done. I mean, so, I would assume I would assume fans would just travel like Mecca to like well, get a tattoo. It's not, from, him. from what I understand, it's not as because Dan is pretty specific and he like has clients that he only works with, so it's not real easy just to like do that. But we had a friend that his name's Chad. I don't want to give too much, but super super amazing guy, and he had Dan do the Z cross on his fucking face. Oh wow! Like on his face, and I couldn't believe anybody would want to do that but that's yeah that to me that's the most intense one he's and, and dan, dan and dan dan actually has a standing rule that he doesn't he usually doesn't give what he calls job killer tattoos right like he doesn't do he doesn't tattoo the face or the Hands, fingers yeah. or but i apparently this guy had a it pretty much was already job killered out and was so dead serious and dan did it yep. and he, he had a show we did in did he come to I think it was, was it Orlando? Yeah, he was in, I think it was a Florida show, yeah. Yeah, the last time we played in Florida on the with with Yushira. I, I want to say it was Orlando. Oh, cool. Yeah, he was there. He was there. Is he from that area kind of thing, or did he just show he's, up? He's he's from, like, the South area. I think, like, he, I like, think he lives in Georgia. He was yes. trying to set something up for us in Georgia at one point. Yeah. Well... We ran the gauntlet, gentlemen, of the internet uh, questions, at least from... Dude, this, I thought... I, mean, I can't <laughs> believe there weren't more brutal, fucked up ones. Well, I didn't ask you the ones off the message board. Well, dude, what, what uh, are we doing? Uh, come what, on. what are we doing here? Man, <laughs> all right. I haven't even pulled it up. I'll pull it up, and we'll knock them out do really one. quick. Right. I'm not, we'll I do, can't yeah, do, do one if I'm... You know what I mean? We'll do the worst. I was going to ask you to do the worst. But I yeah, don't I know what would be the worst. You know what I'm saying? God, there's so yeah, much. Yeah, I don't even know. Nothing will be the worst. I don't even care. Not do only it. that, but like, you know, the We've thread. We've heard and seen it all. The thread will get hijacked. You know what I'm saying? And then they'll talk about something completely different uh, for for a, a lot of it. So I have to go through it. Hold on. Mm. Well, wait, isn't that, is Lamb Gus the one that always talks about how we wish we were Azalea dying, right? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. I think that's it. Yeah, that, that's where that's where the whole as I lay dying versus Zayo argument was was raging for oh, yeah? years. Yeah. See, this one says, "How awesome is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ?" Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's pretty I mean, typical, oh, dude. I be mean, cle more clever. We, Why can't people? They want us to ask you about the other band, Zayo. Oh, the French one. Yeah, the French. The pro, one. Like the dude. The uh, uh, here's one? the thing. I'm actually a fan. Dude, yeah, they're awesome. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're like a, they're a indirect uh, offshoot of the band Magma, which uh, I'm a big Magma fan. So yeah, yeah. How does that work yeah. that they both have you both have the same name? You know what I mean? How does that? Well, work? they don't uh, exist anymore. Uh, they they were like well, a I mean they stuff. might, but they were I think they pretty much only existed in France. And yeah. It, it gets real weird with all that stuff. Like, I don't think either. <laughs> It would be up to them to potentially sue, but who do they sue? And then it's an international lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Does it even hold up? And mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. We just kind of roll and they don't can worry be. About uh, it. They can be Zao Fr from here on out if they ever want to come back. Yeah. Dude, we'll change our name. I don't care. <laughs> uh, is the race okay? Ask them if the race of standings is still about death, or race of standing still about death. Probably. Okay. I think yeah. I, I mean, it's, it, it, you're, 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 
That would be the, that would be the safe bet. That's like betting ba- betting on the you know Patriots and the, or the Tom Brady <laughs> or Tom Brady. Yeah, yeah. A yeah, lot of these. Well, bet. I wouldn't say a lot of these comments. I'm, I'm sure you're going to go back. You're going to go over to the website and read them at some point. But a lot of them are like, I heard, of this, I've heard of this band. So, <laughs> and then they That's were like, uh, you know, they were debating about your music a little bit. I guess. Is it? That's what people on the internet will do. Yeah. Oh my God! See, they're going back and forth with one other person. So hold on. <laughs> oh, as the de- uh, ask them if the Deftones ever talked about taking them on tour. No, no. But, no. but, at one point, I think Stephen Carpenter like mentioned Blood and Fire as a record he liked on in some interview, and I think Jesse met that dude. But I don't think that was ever, not since, I mean, we've never been talked to gotcha. by the Deftones. Do I, I like the Deftones? It's weird how often they come up in, on this podcast. You know, like every podcast, someone's got a Deftones story. Or, oh, I love the Deftones. Yeah, they're awesome. So, yeah. They're good. Crazy. I'm in. Uh, and he also says Angels Without Wings is probably your best song overall. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, in his opinion, I would assume. Uh, ask about the tattoo business, but Dan's not here, so necessarily I don't know if you can speak on that. Yeah, feel free. I don't even know what we he's don't doing, even really know. <laughs> yeah, I think he's doing okay. Dan always is doing okay. Uh, you don't hate Jesse Smith, we've already got into that, they absolutely not. Right, okay, that was I just, I just texted, I was just texting him what like three days ago, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of this is just talking about their favorite albums with, with you guys, so. I'm trying to get through it. Okay, yeah. Nope, I'm not going to ask that last one. All right. No, do it. Oh Are you kidding God, me? Oh, my God, dude. Dude, ask it. Do it. We're brave. We've seen it. I don't know if I should. It. First off, I don't know if I should because, A, this is like a, yeah, a new gimmick character that's jumped onto the uh, to the fucking message board oh. lately. But how many? Just do it. All right. How many of the members of Zaya were... Uh, diddled by their youth pastors <laughs> and i used a different term for diddle uh, i i i don't know i never talked to anybody about that mm, that's good but there there actually is, there is a zayo song about being diddled by a youth pastor mm. yes holy shit you are correct which song are we talking about in general uh if these scars could speak mm, okay. mm-hmm yeah, maybe that's yeah. where that came from. I don't know why this gimmick would yeah. know that. But... I, I think I, I think that's a, I think that's a, I'm pretty sure that's in the documentary. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was uh, Dan's girlfriend at the time while he was on mm-hmm. tour. Mm-hmm. Or you yeah. asked her, raped her. Bummer. Yes. That is no good. No, but that was and that's one. Of, and I think that was one of those. Uh, Scott, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. And I think mm-hmm. that's one of those situations where. The song song subject had to be lied to to solid state. Yeah, there were a few on Liberate that you guys actually told them it was about something other than what it was. Yeah, we had to. Does that come up often, or is it because that label is a is a certain kind of label? It's because of the label and the contract. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, so at at once, like that's the weird thing about solid state. Even like now, that they don't seem to be so much. A religious label but they definitely are like a they they wanted more of a positive type of thing i mean so, i definitely growing up i definitely thought they were strictly religious label and not not well, they, I, and i love a lot of those bands and i love a lot oh, of the sure. they still yeah, are yeah. on there and i i mean i don't think when so most of the bands that they did sign were religious bands because i don't think many other labels were giving those bands a shot so like Tooth and Nail was one of the labels, one of very limited amount of labels that were giving bands the opportunity. Um, but I mean, from what I understood, Brandon Ebel didn't start that as a Christian label. He started that as like a straight, just a, like he was in the punk and he like wanted to start a label and it wasn't really that, but, but he did want positive messages and all that kind of stuff. And it ended up being that for, I mean, if you think that's a positive message or whatever, you know, a lot of the bands ended up being that way. Um, but yeah, Z- I mean, a lot of the lyrics on Liberate, I mean, Savannah's about a porn star. Scars That Speak was about that. Um, 
there's there's a lot of dark but that's the thing about it dude there's like a lot of like dan writes a lot about dark things but there's always like a hope in it yeah. you know it's not like we're not he's not writing about you know savannah he wasn't writing about that to glorify or like exploit the fact that this woman you know had a car accident when just was disfigured and couldn't live because her whole life livelihood was based around her looks. What that song is trying to say is like, we got it as a society. Why would we even let that happen to someone? So like, you know, like there's always like hope in what he's trying to, you know, his perspective or his like, even just sometimes it's just his observation. It's not necessarily like he has a perspective. He's just like observing like, wow, isn't this a, isn't this fucking weird? <laughs> you know, like, what do you, like, what do you think? This is weird to me. So I'm going to talk about it. So, but yeah, we, we couldn't tell them specifically, like, this is what we were, he was, he was talking about. Interesting. Well, damn, I feel like we, again, I told y'all before we shoot for 45 minutes. We have now gone like an hour over that. So we are pulling like, oh. we're pulling uncharted territory for the last, I mean, we I'm used to sorry. do these long ones. No, no. We used to do these long ones. <laughs> Uh, but I feel that because you guys are in the band you're in, uh, the fans obviously are going to be older, wanting longer content anyway. So, cool. I mean, I feel like we could keep going on, but I don't want to because I have to eat dinner, and I'm sure you guys have yeah, to I'm eat s- dinner, and we, everyone's hungry, and it's like almost nine o'clock. <laughs> so we're gonna I'm gonna have some coffee. We're gonna we're gonna so I stay up all night. We're gonna so cut it. We're gonna cut it short here, and we're gonna end on somewhat of a positive note, not more. Let's so do like, it. You know what we were trying to end on prior, but. Guys, it was great to have you on. I'm sure we will have you on again at some point later on down the line. Um, Jeff, obviously, I was sincere when I was talking about the the FATA podcast. It'd be good to do it before. I'll, I'll, hook, I'll hook you up with this, guys. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, you're more than welcome to be on that as well, obviously, because you, you and Francis would be a, de- a decent episode. But again, I know Francis is tough to get a hold of. I'm not going to hold you to it. But I look forward. I look forward to seeing you guys in person. Uh, do a high five, you know, at the Furnace Fest. Uh, I'll be there. I already got my ticket, even though I'm probably going to do some media dealio there. I just made sure that I had a ticket. Um, awesome. But yeah, and kudos to us boys for going an hour forty two without talking about. Hey, did you write your damn record during COVID? Hey, what are you doing during COVID? Like. Yeah, most there was of the podcast. Shit, I didn't... Yeah, most of the podcasts I've had recently are just like, "Hey, COVID." So it was a breath of fresh yeah. air to not really talk about that guy. <laughs> I, it was, and thank you so much for having us, dude. They're like we, yeah, I'm, I, I'm so happy to do these things. Oh, well, we'll we'll definitely get you guys on. Uh, now that I have a better way to contact you, I won't have to go through the band email because I sent that weeks ago, and I think I remember talking to Yashira about like, "Damn, it would be really cool to have those guys on." So. I'm glad that it eventually came into fruition. That's my, that that's that's all my fault. I, I I'm not blaming anybody. Just, no one's hey, getting blamed. No one's it's, getting blamed, Jeff. Don't worry about that. I'm just you know you got a you got a band email on the Facebook. I don't expect it to be responsive. You know what I mean? I I would assume everyone gets emails constantly, and I would when I email. Uh, so when we, I email we're usually Facebook, pretty good. Yeah, but when I email bands, I assume that like they're gonna, especially if I'm emailing the email off of like the website or the Facebook and not going through a PR person. It's usually like yeah. a 50, 50 crap shot that they'll even get that message, you know? So who knows? But anyway, I appreciate it. Nonetheless, we definitely will do this again and I can't wait awesome. to see you guys in September. Awesome, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>